Hello and welcome to another TLDR Explains video. In this one, I'm going to be taking a look at the UK government's decision not to extend the transition period for the UK leaving the EU, and whether or not that's a sensible decision, and whether or not that will end up leading to a no-deal Brexit. With the news always focusing on the people who live in number 10 and 11 Downing Street, it's easy to lose perspective, to forget all of the people with all of the beliefs and values that make up a nation. We've just released the 30 Doors design, which aims to reset that balance, to focus on all of the people and all of the doors. We've even designed some of the doors based on ones sent to us by our viewers. Check out the design and the more minimal six door variant on our store. It's linked down below. So, while the news has been swamped with coronavirus stuff, you might have seen that the UK isn't planning on extending the transition period. Now, this has been a party line for a couple of months now, since the coronavirus' spread began in the UK. Michael Gove told a select committee on March 11th that coronavirus wasn't going to make them extend the transition period. Um, given the spread of the coronavirus across Europe, what impact, if any, will coronavirus on the uh, the deadline, and could there be a possible extension to that deadline? No, there won't be any extension to the deadline. Johnson was asked about it pretty directly a week later and said pretty much the same thing. Brexit uh, transition period, the country clearly wants you to focus on dealing with the criminal crisis, what you are doing. Will you rule out extending the transition period here and now, or might that be something you, you want to consider in the future? That's clear. Um, and you had another question. What was it about? There's another subject. What was it? It's a subject that's been banished. Uh, it's been done. Uh, it's been, it's been, it's been, it's, it's, I think, I, it's a, not a subject that's being regularly discussed, I can tell you, in, in, in Downing Street at the moment. And uh, we're getting on with, uh, you know, the, there are, there are um, legisl there's legislation in place that uh, I have no intention uh, of changing. At the same time, Jacob Rees-Mogg said a similar thing in the House of Commons to Labour MP Justin Madders, and Dominic Raab even claimed that extending the transition period would hamper the EU and UK's coronavirus response, because, according to him, it would lead to more uncertainty. Basically, it seems that someone put out a memo to all Conservative MPs telling them to really put out the message that the UK wasn't going to be extending the transition period, and they all seemed to get on board. And fair enough, this is the Brexit government after all, but it's worth remembering that this was all in early mid-March. In early March, Parliament and schools were still open, the government was still planning on holding elections in May, and herd immunity was still the official policy. All of these things have changed now that we know how serious the coronavirus actually is. But notably, one thing hasn't changed, and that's the government's position on the transition period. On April 15th, the government reiterated its commitment to not extending the transition period. This was so bonkers to some people that commentators started speculating this was merely a political statement to force the EU into offering an extension, which might have been a little more politically palatable for the UK government. But the very next day, the government came out and made it even clearer, saying that if the EU asks, they'll say no. In the government's words, we will not ask to extend the transition, and if the EU asks, we will say no. Extending the transition would simply prolong the negotiations, prolong business uncertainty, and delay the moment of control of our borders. It would also keep us bound to EU legislation at a point when we need economic and legislative flexibility to manage the UK's response to the coronavirus pandemic. So, what was the UK thinking here? There are three main possibilities we can think of. The first and most obvious is that it's a political stance to curry favour with Brexiteers. Perhaps this made sense in early March, but most polling today suggests that public opinion is swinging towards an extension. YouGov polling conducted on April 8th found that 56% of the public support an extension, while only 27% oppose one. Polling done two weeks later on April 19th by Focal Data found that 66% of the public wants an extension, and that of this 66%, 64% want an indefinite extension. In fact, this poll found that 48% of Conservative voters want an extension, and even 45% of Brexit Party voters want one. Looking at this polling, the politically savvy move would seem to be an extension. So why else might the government be so anti-extension? Well, the second possible reason is that they think that they can get a deal done in the six months and therefore don't need an extension. This is pretty unlikely, 
The time frame was already pretty tight, and it's been made even tighter by the coronavirus. And the whole thing is made even more unlikely by the fact that the two sides' draft negotiating mandates are miles apart. The EU seems to want a deep association agreement with alignment on workers' rights, taxation, environmental protections, state aid, subsidies to businesses and even level playing field provisions, with the European Court of Justice ruling on any disputes. Basically, the idea is that the UK would match EU standards, maintaining a level playing field between the two, as agreed by the political declaration. This is what all EU member states currently do, because when the EU decides to, say, raise environmental protections, all EU member states, as part of the single market, follow suit. Level playing field provisions are, as you might have guessed, about keeping competition between the two parties fair. The EU's worried that without appropriate provisions, the UK might slash its current standards to try and undercut the EU, turning the UK into a so-called Singapore upon Thames. The UK, on the other hand, want a trade deal similar to CETA, the trade deal agreed by Canada and the EU back in 2014. To be clear, CETA, like basically all other trade agreements, does have some form of level playing field provisions on stuff like intellectual property rights, but it's nowhere near as deep as the EU wants the agreement to be with the UK. In fact, if you read the UK's negotiating mandate, you'll notice this phrase popping up several times. In line with precedents such as CETA and the EU-Japan EPA, this should not be subject to the agreement's dispute resolution mechanism outlined on Chapter 32. This rather complex phrase, or some variation of it, is repeated five times throughout the UK's mandate, regarding to state aid, competition laws, labour regulations, environmental regulations and tax. Basically, it translates to the UK saying, in pretty explicit terms, that these level playing field provisions are not included in Canada's deal, so we don't want them in ours either. So why doesn't the UK want level playing field provisions in these sectors? Well, according to the UK, it's merely a matter of sovereignty, and not just so that they can undercut the EU. Both sides have a point here. You can completely understand why the EU aren't particularly trustful of the UK, but at the same time, given that most labour regulation actually originates in the UK and goes far above the EU minimum, it seems unlikely that the UK is going to turn into some low-tax, laissez-faire, neoliberal paradise anytime soon. Anyway, this whole level playing field thing is just one of many unresolved issues. The UK hasn't even produced a draft text on fishing, which is supposed to be completed by July and no one knows what's going to happen with the Irish border. The long and short of it is that the two sides are still pretty far apart, and when you consider how long the EU's trade deals have taken with other countries, and the fact that most of the UK and EU's political energy is being put into dealing with the coronavirus crisis, a deal seems pretty unlikely, if not impossible. A third reason why the UK might want to resist an extension is if the UK government thinks an extension is worse than a no deal. Any extension will require some new negotiations on how much the UK contributes to the EU's multi-annual financial framework, and the sum could be as much as £800 million a month. Also, during the extended transition, the UK would remain under the EU's Common Commercial Policy, or CCP, which means that it wouldn't be able to strike trade deals with other countries. And if somewhere like the US decided to place damaging tariffs on the EU, they'd still apply to the UK as well. There are also some concern that the UK might have to continue paying into the European Investment Bank, but this isn't entirely true. Under the withdrawal agreement, the UK is only liable to European Investment Bank projects approved before January 31st, 2020. So unless this is an added condition to any extension, it seems unlikely that the UK would have to pay more. So these are just some of the economic downsides involved in extending the transition period. But are they way worse than those that come with a no-deal exit? Obviously, no one knows exactly how bad a no-deal exit would be, but a combination of no-deal chaos plus coronavirus chaos seems, well, pretty chaotic. And at the very least, it's a very risky calculation on the government's part. Anyway, we're not completely sure why the government hasn't asked for an extension yet. It could be about keeping Brexiteers on side, or it could be about avoiding further financial commitments, or they might just truly believe that a deal is somewhere around the corner. Whatever the case, it all feels like a pretty risky call. What do you think of the UK's decision? 
Do you think that the UK and EU should agree to extend the transition period in the light of the coronavirus? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. You can also get involved in the conversation over on Discord. If you want to be updated on this crisis as it continues, then be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified whenever we release a video. You can also get more from us across all social networks simply by searching for TLDR News. A special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible.